Um, one day, late at night, um, for example, after the Haiti earthquake, and um, you're watching a telethon. And obviously these huge superstars are, are there uh, having you try to donate. And so you get a little bit emotional because, wow, you're like, Mark Wahlberg, uh, Jack Nicholson, I, I really want to donate. And I really love George Clooney. And so you're going to give $20 to the cause, Help for Haiti. And usually what happens is you get a really good feeling in your heart. Uh, you get a thank you letter most of the time, sometimes. And you get a tax ID, like kind of like a, you get a, basically a deduction. Um, but you don't really get much more. And so when three months later, Help for Haiti comes back and asks you for more money, you have no idea where the money went. Right? You have no idea what it was used for, what, what, what they used to buy, what they bought with the money, what the impact was. And basically, if they're going to ask you for more money, you're not really going to trust them because you're like, what did, what did you do with my money last time? So to solve this problem, we started a reaction strategy group. What a reaction strategy group does is helps nonprofits and social entrepreneurs tell their donors and constituents where their money went in hopes that this, because of the added trust, the donors will give more. Let me give you a couple examples. This is Uncultured Project is a project on YouTube where Sean is working on water projects in Bangladesh. And he makes videos of every single water project he does. He, he makes videos of the wells that are built, and he captures the stories of the, of the students there that are benefiting from the clean water. As a result, people are sharing his videos, and he has more subscribers than all of the major nonprofits combined. And in, like, just like other nonprofits who see their donations go up during disaster and go down, his have exponentially increased over time because of what we call the feedback loop. Another type of feedback loop is an event feedback loop. You guys are all familiar with Relay for Life. And if you think about it, the Cancer Society has a really hard time telling people where their money went because it's used for research. You can't really quantify it. And so what they have is an event, the Relay for Life, where they can basically show off the results of the research to survivors in a very strong survivor block. So we're the organization that goes to the Red Cross and says, hey, taking all the phone numbers that you have from Haiti, you should keep in touch with the donors and continue to text them updates of where their money went. We're also the organization that really loves it when Kiva and Donors Choose and Global Giving posts blogs from the people who are the, bene uh, the beneficiaries of uh, microfinance loans. Uh, so a little bit of a background on what we did. So our story is we started in January of this year. Um, and we entered two competitions, the Goose Egg Challenge that Jimmy described earlier and the Ashoka Startup Scramble. And because of these challenges, we were forced to think about, about a lot of our, um, our, our business model and think about what we wanted to do, why we were doing it, what our advantages were. And I'll go into that more of that later. Uh, we were able to win both competitions. It's $5,000 for Goose Egg and $1,000 for Startup Scramble, which was pretty, a pretty good amount to start a consulting firm because we don't have that many overhead costs. Um, and we were basically forced to present to <coughs> judges and answer a lot of really tough questions. Um, so far, we started out with two team members, and we've grown to 11. We just recruited five this last weekend. Um, and we basically have three consulting teams working on two clients, including this one, and we have three more clients in the pipeline ready to go. Now, the, the reason why we believe in our business model a lot, and before I go on to kind of this, this, the lessons that I learned, was, is because we think it's a win-win-win solution. First, the donors win, because usually as a donor, you don't really expect that much. You give $5, give $10, you really don't know where your money went. It's fine, it's donations. This is kind of the way they've been doing it all this time. But if you were to go out and buy, let's say, a shirt or a jacket, you would also try it on, or if you, you, know, if you bought a, it's like buying a car without doing a test drive. You don't know, I mean, donations like the one thing that you really don't pay that much attention to in terms of like you know, figuring out where the money went and um, doing all your research. And so the, the donors win because they get more uh, information. The organization wins because, because of the increased information and the increased trust, the organization gets more money and donor retention rates go up just like the In Culture Project did. And then finally the cause wins because of the increased money. So it's a win-win-win for us. So I'm going to talk about a couple of lessons that we've learned so far in the, in the months that we've been in business. And um, you know, obviously we have a long way to go, but these are the four things that we picked up. The first thing I want you guys to 
think about is the root cause analysis. Now, how many of you, if you raise your hand, already have kind of a business idea in mind and you're, you're coming to this competition because you think you might be able to get some money for it? Okay. Uh, for your root cause analysis, I want you to think about what problem you're solving. So just think about it in your head. And then for those of you who don't have a business idea yet, just think of some kind of problem in your community that you might want to solve in the future. So you can either write it down or you can think about it in your head. So for us, the problem is that only 30% of donors give to the same nonprofit more than once a year. Okay? Now ask yourself why. So why does that problem exist? That leads you to the second, the, well, the cause that's kind of more root than that. So only the reason why 30% of people only donate is because only one in 10 people, according to an NBC study, actually really trust their nonprofit. So then you ask yourself, why again? And so why is it only one in 10? Is it because they don't get enough information because of all the scandals? And so why don't they get, get enough information? Because nonprofits don't care that much, or they don't have that much money, or they don't have the time. And why don't they have the time? Because they're too busy doing the operations. And so reaction takes that root cause because they don't have the time and they don't have the money, and we solve that problem. So think about whatever business idea you have or whatever problem you have, and drill down to the root cause, the, the very last why, where you can't even ask why again, and make sure you're solving that problem. And then one more thing that I would add to that would be, when you're solving that problem, ask yourself two more questions. One of them is, can you be passionate about this? Now, obviously, you could be like, you know, I feel like flies are a problem in our, in our dorms, and so we need fly swatters. But, you know, I can get down to the root cause of that, and then at the end, I'm not going to wake up in the morning feeling really excited to sell fly swatters. So think about what you're passionate about, and also think about your solution. Can it be the best in the world at solving this problem? Our goal at Reaction is to be the best in the world at consulting in terms of feedback loops specifically, at helping nonprofits uh, basically communicate with donors. We want to be the best in the world at that. Can you, be, can you offer the best solution in the world for that root cause? The second thing is I want to talk about a little bit about what we gained from going through GUSEC. The one thing we gained from going through GUSEC the most was being forced to do research. Now, in January, before GUSEC started, it's kind of an idea that we were throwing around um, and we didn't really take that much action on it because there was no pressure to. You know, we're students, there, there's, I mean, because even if you don't start a company, you're not going to, you know, not have any food to eat. You're always, always going to have Leos. Um, but so, there's not that much pressure. But when you have deadlines, like the ones that Jimmy talked about earlier, you're really forced to think about all the facets. And so, this is our business plan. This is the table of content of our, for our business plan. And it's not really showing, but we had to think about things like competitive analysis, what our advantages are, what makes us better than any other consulting firm. Um, think about what our weaknesses are and how we can hedge against them. Um, and basically think everything through and ask yourself really tough questions that you probably would have never asked before. Um, we had to think about pricing, which we never had to, so we called up a lot of consulting firms when we asked about pricing. And we also asked for a lot of feedback. And in the course of getting feedback, we had a lot of really harsh feedback. Someone was like, someone was like if I was a nonprofit, I would definitely not hire you guys. I was like, okay. Well. <laughs> Uh, maybe I should just throw away this, this business idea then. Uh, and we were, there were professors, we had mentors, who basically are now kind of our board members and mentors as we go on and build this business because they were able to, we were able to incorporate their feedback. And so um, that's really important. And so even if you're kind of thinking about an idea and you're not sure that you want to be able to launch it, um, even if you don't think your idea may be good enough to last through the round of 16 or something like that, I encourage you to really, really apply because you get a lot of feedback and you think about things that you never would have thought of. But really quick, going back to that point, at the same time, don't take yourself too seriously when you're writing the business plan. Uh, one, one thing that a lot of people think about when they write a business plan is they think when they're writing a business plan, they're writing a document that guides all their decisions for the future. That when they make a decision in the future, they're going to go back to the business plan and say, nope, back in the business plan we decided that um, we're going to go with a, the, the choice A always, and so we're going to go with choice A. But think of the business plan as a living document where you're going to be editing it all the time or you're at least going to be going back and referring to it. But make sure that, but know that like you, when you're making decisions, let's say, sorry, five months in, in the future, you're making decisions when there's more information. With five months in the future, you have more information about where you are. So why would you use your business plan to make the decision five months in the future? So make sure you don't take it too seriously when you're writing the business plan. You're thinking about things and you're creating guidelines, but you're, these are not things that you have to stick to. So don't worry about all those super minor details. Third part is finding a team. I get that a lot of you have ideas that you think this is your baby and you don't want to let go and also you don't want it to get ruined by working with someone else. But 
know that when you're working with a team, it's a lot more fun. Um, this is the this is my the CFO Yo. He currently goes to Wharton. I know he left us. It was really sad. Um, but it was really cool having a, a team member who you can basically bounce ideas off of. I would come up with some really crazy idea. Um, he would tell me that, no, James, that's stupid. Um, you can have people basically get together with you on a Saturday and a Sunday when everyone else is out, and they can, you can motivate each other to do some work and get cracking on this business plan. So it's really important to have a team. Um, Jim Collins, in the book Good to Great, also mentions that when you're finding a team, it's first who, then what. What it means is, don't worry about, oh, I need to find a CFO, and so I have to find someone who's really financially literate to, to, because I, I can't do math. Or, I have to find someone who's really good at operations. It's first who, then what, which means, first find your friends who are on board with your leadership style and believe in you. Because, he says in the book, let's say they get on the bus, it doesn't matter which seats they're on, if you're guiding the bus and the bus goes to another place, let's say you decide to, um, change your business plan and change your business idea. This is not exactly what they signed up for in the beginning. They'll go with you because they believe in you and they be believe in your leadership style. So it's first who, then what. And the fourth thing is something that I took from Jason Fried of uh, the Re Rework is no time is no excuse. Um, a lot of people think that since we're students, we don't have time. We have five classes, <coughs> we have to go on Thursdays and Fridays, on, on weekends, you know, we have to do homework. Um, on weekdays, we have other extracurriculars. We never have the time to actually, you know, it, it, do you have to drop out of school to, to start the next Facebook or start something else? Uh, the, argu the argument is, if you, if you say you have no time, you just don't want it bad enough. But basically, you s just think about all the time during the day, even today, maybe. You think about all the time where you kind of uh, watch an extra video on YouTube, spend a little bit more time um, chilling on Facebook, or you know, during class you're not really paying attention, you're, you're on your computer, but you're just chatting with your friend and not spending that time thinking about things. You just don't want it enough. You, you can also always find time during your day in between classes, um, in between um, homework assignments, you know, go to dinner with your business partner and, and, and think about your business at the dinner table, at Leo's, even though I don't know why you would want to do that. Um, but you, so definitely don't let time be an excuse for you. So in closing, I have kind of three really quick thoughts. The first one was something that stuck with me when, when Richard Branson visited us in Lower Fink last, last, um, was last semester or this semester? This semester. Um, when he said that this is the perfect time for you to start your own company because you know once you graduate, you're going to become a lot more risk averse. You're going to be thinking about the jobs that you're going to have, you're going to be weighing against those jobs, the salaries, you're going to have, um, you're going to be worrying about getting an apartment, you don't want to have a roommate. And so right now, while we're kind of in the cozy kind of zone of Georgetown, this is the perfect time for you to take some risks and, and, and test out your idea. The second thing is be extraordinary. The one key part to winning this competition is that you just want to blow everyone away. And so if you were going to make a PowerPoint, how can you take that further? So what we did was we, we part of our PowerPoint was a video. We had this video with a voiceover that kind of uh, impressed the judges. Uh, the other thing is, and you'll see later, in, instead of doing regular business cards, we did round business cards. So what is one way you can take things to another level and make yourself stand out? And the third thing is, ide uh, from Rework, ideas are immortal, inspiration is perishable, and inspirational, inspiration is a productivity multiplier. And so right now when you're sitting in this room, you may be coming up with ideas and you're like, I want to do this, I want to do this. Just go out and do it right now because your ideas will always be there but your inspiration tomorrow when you wake up in the morning you'll be like oh, I don't really feel like it anymore and so I urge you to really go out there and do it um, make sure you sign up for this competition and really push yourself and apply these pressures and you'll never know where you end up thanks very much and that's why